What's up guys? So in continuing with the theme this week, today is the last video from Meltdown in the Desert. And I do wanna take a second real quick to give a huge shout out to Kobe K. He was the one that put on this event, him and Steve Fielding. Um, like I said in the first video from Meltdown, people kept telling me before that it had been that you can't really explain it, you just have to experience it. And it was one of the most incredible events I've ever been to. If you wanna find out more information about it, go to meltdownevent.com. That's meltdownevent.com. It'll have some information about this past and when they have the next one next year, you'll know exactly where to go. I uh, highly recommend that. On this last video, we're gonna have Reezy Resells teach a workshop and Here's the focus and what I want you to get out of this video. Reezy Resales is one of the most humble individuals I've ever been around. I've spent hours talking to this guy. I had him on my podcast months and months ago. But in this video, he literally gives you the blueprint, step by step, what to do to make money when you have zero resources. What to do to make money today that you can use to start funding more money, funding more money, and roll those things into a significant income that you can start bringing in, just with stuff around your house that you already have. But he goes step by step in how to do that and lays it out like I've never seen before. So at this point, there's really no excuse uh, to be broke and to stay broke. You can be broke, but we don't want you to stay broke. And we wanna make sure that our content that's going out is for absolutely everybody. The high, high, high level CEO, entrepreneur, influencer, and the person that's just getting started Started, or the person that's had some setbacks in life is trying to get back on their feet. This video will, will lay out exactly how you do that. I love Reezy's personality. You'll see that come out in this video. He's just an incredible human being. The last thing I'll mention about him when I say he's humble, Gary V talks about, um, about going humble. And for a lot of people that he's talking to, he uses that in the perspective of like, don't buy that fourth car, don't buy that third home, don't buy that you know, fifth watch. Reezy literally talks about the fact that he made a decision with his family that even though they were already on food stamps, they were gonna do one dinner at a soup kitchen uh, per night to be able to take that extra money in the week and use that to buy more books that they would then resale and flip and then be able to fund purchasing more toys, more just stuff that they could then go sell, make more money, and then that's how he really dug himself out of a hole and got to where he's at now, which is living extremely comfortably. And more importantly, he's just happy. He's like one of the happiest dudes I've ever been around. He, he um, uh, homeschools his daughter and just seems like he's got an awesome home life, really living life uh, to the fullest and seems to have a ton of fulfillment in life. And so this is now his way of giving back by teaching other people to do the same. I strongly encourage you taking some notes because you will get some stuff out of this that you can actually go and implement and make some money next week if you put in the work. He's circle like he's the best at what he does. And you want to know how to get a hold of people? Do you guys know how the Tom Billy story, how Tom got here last year? I called him. I don't know Tom. Brandon Duncan knows Yemeni. Yemeni was at the desk meet with Tom. And so I was talking to Brandon. I said, Brandon, we need one more something. Maybe the event's missing something. Well, I'm with Yemeni. I know Tom. I've been following. I've known Tom for, I've known of Tom for years. And I pulled behind some crusty ass Circle K that literally smelled like urine and got a quest bar. And like, I said, Brandon, I'm, I didn't even tell him what I was doing. And I like filmed the video. I was like, oh, hey, Tom. I'm just here eating a quest bar. You know what would make this quest bar really more enjoyable would be you joining us at my event. I'd like to talk more with you. If you've got an opportunity, I'd like to talk to your admin about scheduling. I said some corny shit and sent it to Brandon. I said, because he was with Tom, I said, keep this to Tom. Two days later, Tom's assistant calls me. And then Tom and I built the friendship. We're homies. How did I get to Tom? I called him. How did Reezy get to me? I called him, I told him, listen, hey man, like I tried to provide value. People that you're trying to get to from an influencer perspective, because you are the net sell, one of the five people that you, you hang out with, Dan, did I screw that up? Thank you, I tried. Is you, you just reach out to them. And this is another one of those examples of a guy that in his field, how many like messages do you get hundreds a day about? Mm, across like everything. Yeah, across yeah. everything. And it's that one time, at that one moment, when that one message hits, and it's like, I'm gonna call. And four months later, I was just like, dude, dude I'd love to have you here because what you do has so much value. He said, you help thousands of people. I was like, it would be cool to have you come in. So without that, enough of that. Breezy. Take it away. You need to be up on stage. You want to do it down here? You got it. What are you doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would do it from down here, but I'm 5'3", and I don't know how that's going to work. So 
Do I have a clicker? Is there a clicker? Yes, sir. Hold up. I can't do anything without the clicker. One of the funniest things I've heard actually this entire time, we did a video workshop on Thursday with like 13 people. Reese's never seen Tyler Harris in real life. And we're oh sitting my there. God. And he's quiet. He's so I'll quiet. Never this shit down. You're not. He's quiet. Reese's really quiet. He's super into it. He's quiet. And he's sitting there. He hasn't seen it. He's sitting on his laptop and taking notes. And Tyler's talking. And out of nowhere, Reese goes, You're a lot smaller than I expected you to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly how I said it, but pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how many of you guys would like to make an extra thousand dollars a month? How many of you guys are unhappy with your nine to five and would like to be able to replace that income or even more and then do whatever the fuck it is that you actually want to do? Alright, I know we got some big earners in here so it might not apply to everybody but you can do it on a small scale and you can do it on a large scale and that is reselling, flipping shit. There's a million sides to this coin, it's not just one or two ways that you can do it, but I'm gonna share my story with you and how I've done it, and then I'm gonna give you a very basic intro to how you can do it. And so the goal is, besides knowing my story, is that when I get off the stage, you'll know enough to be able to start doing it yourself, to be on the way to becoming an expert for free, to be able to find the resources that you need to fully understand um, everything there is about it. First, before I get started, is there anybody in the in the room that already sells on eBay or Amazon? Yeah. Awesome, awesome, that's great. Anybody um, do private label or wholesale on eBay or Amazon? Awesome, Shop, any Shopify sellers in here? Uh, yeah, there I am. Um, you can follow me on whatever, it's all Reezy Resells. Last year, uh, we did 865,000 uh, gross sales on Amazon selling used books, which is surprising to a lot of people. They don't think books are worth money. Um, I forget the gentleman earlier who did the, uh, or yesterday, the publishing thing. He said, he, he threw out the statistics of Amazon sales per year, and he talked about how much of that is books. And I think it was 30 billion. It was probably like 20% of the total number or whatever. That's fucking huge. Because like, who doesn't, like I'm fucking, if I, people ask me what I do, and I'm like, well you know, when you buy stuff on Amazon, and they're like, no, I don't shop on Amazon. I'm like, the fuck are you? <laughs> like, but where do you get stuff? Like, you, you, you go to the store to get stuff? What the hell? <laughs> uh, anyway, so basically, e-commerce changed my life. Uh, a little over 13 years ago, I worked in a skateboard shop. I'm a, if you don't know guys, I'm a skateboarder. Not as much as I used to be, but I'm still a skateboarder. Um, I thought it was gonna be a dream job. We'll find out if it was or it wasn't, but I made 20,000 a year, and that was the most I ever made in my entire life. And I, I thought it was, I thought it was cool at the time. Um, and then I, then I grew up a little bit. So let's go through this. Um, so yeah, basically, life's a bitch, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit of my, my story. So I grew up on food stamps, welfare, government health care. My parents were divorced. Alcohol, drugs, jail, prison, uh, neglected, and I became this bad kid, you know, because what do you do when you want attention, you know, you, you find out how to get it, right? So, there's no such thing as a bad kid, I've, I've since learned or whatever. But, um, yeah, I eventually ended up in a juvenile hall, uh, I was doing drugs, at age 16, I got married, had a kid, dropped out of school in 10th grade, and started living on my own, and then, I started in the 9 to 5 world, started working 40 hours a week, found out who Mr. Coffee was, started drinking coffee. Uh, but I don't tell you that to like make you feel sorry for me, you know? I just, I just want to set the tone. And uh, basically, this, this is my wife, my beautiful wife, right here. She's, uh, I think she's laughing because I told her I don't have a boss, probably. So she's like, yeah, right, you don't have a boss. I'm the boss. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's thanks to her that, like, you know, Thanks, babe. She's in the back right there. Can you stand up real quick, babe? Woo! Uh, thank you for believing in me and all my crazy ideas and uh, never leaving my side and just, you know, seeing it through, you know? She, we've been married since we were 16, so she basically raised me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not joking when I say that. I was, like a, I was still a little kid, totally. 
Um, she's the best wife, the best mom, like the hardest working woman I ever met. Like I've told her this many times. I was like, man, I wish you were my mom. Because my mom didn't do those things that, that she does that I see her doing. And, and it's, it's very inspiring. Being a mother is, I don't give a fuck what you do, being a mother is the hardest job in the fucking world. Like, it just doesn't end. So, shout out to my wife and, and any other mothers out there. Uh, but the reason that I told you my, my sob story is because if I did this shit, you can do it too. No fucking questions asked, you can do it. Guaranteed. Um, and all the bad shit that happened in my life taught me a lot of stuff. So I learned how to get attention, right? I learned how to recognize an opportunity. And because I grew up so poor, I've never had anything to lose. So I literally, I think of shit, I have the opportunity, I, I ask, I, I pitch, I swing the bat. Like, I don't give a fuck. And I remember the first time I realized this, when I was like 11 or 12, maybe 10, I don't know, talking to girls. And instantly I lost my shyness to talk to girls because I was like, fuck, I might never see that. I lived by an amusement park, right? And so I would see a lot of girls from out of town on the weekend. And uh, I was like, I'll never see her again. Like, what the fuck do I have to lose to try and go talk to this girl or ask for her telephone number, right? So uh, I also learned, you know, how to get what I wanted, how to be self-sufficient, you know? Like, I didn't want to go home. I knew if I went home to try and eat something, who knows what the fuck's going to happen with my dad at home. So. You know, we were living in hotels, I, I was homeless at times, and so I had to be self-sufficient. I had to figure out how to make money on my own just to get some food because I didn't want to go home. Um, so in high school and in middle school, I sold candy. I eventually started selling, selling drugs, nothing serious, just weed. Like, I don't even think that's really a drug anymore. But um, it taught me a lot of stuff, right? That, that shit taught me sales, right? Like I learned, market, economy, like a bubble, take shit from over here, take it over there, you know, like selling shit. One of my first hustles ever, I used to go to the apartment complex around the corner and I would take a shopping cart and I would just steal all the recycling from the recycling thing because it's worth money and they all live in a complex and they just put it in the aggregated thing, they're not cashing it in. And then I would push it about a mile, I must have been only like eight or ten years old, um, cash it in, get the money, and then I would go into the grocery store and buy soda or in, and water. Then I would hide my textbooks in a bush, I would get, steal a trash bag, put that in my backpack, go to a hotel, steal ice, put that in my backpack, and then fill up my backpack with sodas and water, and I would walk along the beach and sell water and sodas for a dollar. And so that was like the first hustle that I did, and like my friends were doing other shit, but I, I just learned to make money and I became excited with ways to make money, right? Um, and just seeing my family grow up always complaining about money. It was always fucking money. It was always unhappiness. And, and so I just learned that like, there was different ways to do this thing. Um, age 15, I discovered eBay, right? Like Christopher fucking Columbus. Um, <laughs> they, were running, they were running ads on. They were running ads on, on, uh, on TV, and I saw them. And because of my previous experience selling candy and selling drugs, I knew that I could do this shit, right? So I sold everything. And I already, um, I didn't live with my mom at the time. I lived with my sister, but my mom was supporting me a little bit. And she let me sell like almost everything in the entire house that she had. I was like, just, you want this, mom? Like, what is it? I was a pencil holder and I'm just looking it up on eBay, right? That's the key to learning how to sell shit is to understand what, what's worth value. So like, if you don't know how to look up completed sales on eBay, you search for some shit, you say show completed and sold, and you look at what actually sold for what price, right? And I could literally do that for the rest of my life. It's exciting to me to be able to go, wait, fucking marbles are worth money? Wait, fucking... Pencils are worth money, like, it's, it's endless, right? You can learn so much shit. Um, so I basically sold everything I could in the entire house. At one point, um, I sold my brother's Nintendo that he didn't want anymore as a Nintendo 64, but I sold it in a pile, like, Nintendo 64 games, controllers, the everything. The guy that bought it, his name was Video Game Seller Guy or some shit like that. Enough that made me go look at his seller account, and I was like, motherfucker, he's selling a Nintendo, a controller a game, a uh, AV cable, and that's when I realized that he was making money off of the purchase that we made, and that's when I learned the concept of breaking bulk, buying multiple shit at a time, getting a deal, because there's less buyers for a pile of shit, and then breaking it up, and then we started, I was living in Kansas at the time, because I got shipped off, I was a bad kid, 
Um, so then we started buying shit off eBay and selling back on eBay, and I became like enamored with the concept of of finding the right buyer for the right thing, and I just I, I just understood it a lot more. Um, so then I went to uh, I wasn't making a ton of money selling. Like I was only 15, 16 years old, and I had a kid when I was 16, so I had to get some shitty jobs, which I, I think is what most people do when they have zero experience. Um, so my first job I remember I was a telemarketer. Fucking sucked so bad. I hate fucking calling people and trying to sell them fucking sprint nickel nights and weekends or whatever the fuck it was. You guys remember those calls? People trying to call you and like get you on the five cents a minute weekend long distance plan. Um, I also delivered pizza for a while, which. Although I still say it's a shitty job, it's like the best shitty job ever. You just drive around, listen to music, you when in between pizza deliveries, you're eating pizza, you get all the free pizza you want, like, it's a shitty job. And if you're good, you can make 20 bucks an hour fucking easy delivering pizza, but you gotta be on your shit. Um, but yeah, so the shitty jobs were in full effect. Um, eventually we moved back to California. My wife is working as a CNA. Um, I'm, we're working like basically opposite shifts at this point, and I'm working the skate shop job for 20000 a year, which at the time I thought was my dream job. What I realized was it was just more sales, and there was the shitty thing that would happen. The skate shop would be hosting an event, but I couldn't go to the event because I had to be inside selling helmets to kids. Ugh. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's the worst thing. You're at the skate shop, and your friends are coming in to set up new gear to go out of town to go on a session. And you can't go. Like, fucking sleep. You're, you're already dreaming about when you get off your shitty job to do the thing you want, and then your friends are coming in to tell you that they're gonna go do it right now, and you're like, fuck, how many more hours do I got? It's, it's the worst thing ever. So, I had a massive reality check that that shit just fucking, it just sucked, right? You know? And, and I was still selling, but I wasn't making much money. I was basically making grocery money. 500 bucks a month or less which at the time was, it was great to, just to be able to make some extra money. It, it just wasn't enough. Um, and then one day while I was out um, buying shit to sell on eBay, I would see people scanning books in a store and that piqued my interest. And I was like, what the fuck are they doing with books? Like fucking books? Like I knew they were selling them just because you can tell when you're a seller, you know another seller. But they were using uh, laser beams of some sort to scan the books, and it seemed pretty fast. And I was like, okay, a laser beam costs like 100 or 300 bucks. They've invested in this, they're definitely making some money. And so I would say, hey, what are you doing, Tyler? Over here with these books. And then Tyler was like, this. And we were trying to talk to an adult, and they act like you don't fucking exist, like you're fucking invisible. And I was like, damn, they're making way more money than I thought. And they were, they were <laughs> playing up, right? Like, they didn't even want to talk to me at all. And so, but at the time, um, it was the dinosaur age. It was 2004. So, there was no YouTube, there was no iPhone, there was no fucking reason to resell. Pete Gary Vee hadn't told everyone to give the game away for free yet. And so, there was nobody that I knew of I couldn't figure it out. I fucking spent nights nice Googling, and my Google Foo is strong, strong as fuck. I'll challenge anybody to a Google Foo match. And I couldn't figure this shit out. I'm looking up book scanning. All that comes up is software to digitize books, right? And it, it's, I just couldn't figure it out, right? I, was, I hit a roadblock. I it's 80 hours of Googling trying to figure this shit out, and I couldn't fucking figure it out, which was really frustrating. So I went back to just selling whatever the fuck I knew on eBay. And I would occasionally see these booksellers, different ones, and I would ask them every time, because that's, as far as I know, that's my only in, because I can't fucking figure it out. And they would always clam up, just reinforcing me even more that I think it must be very lucrative. And then one day, I seen an old lady scanning books. Bless that old lady. Her name's Phyllis. I, uh, I asked her, I said, hey, what are you doing? And she fucking gave me the game. She told me everything. She said, I'm selling books on Amazon. And, and, and I was close enough to see the hardware she was using. And so I, you know, Dell, Laxon, fucking Pocket PC, PDA, the four smartphones. And, um, and then she told me the name of the software she was using. And I was like, fuck. And so then I went to their website and they had supplemental information. And I found, um, I found like some blogs and shit. 
And so I figured it out, right? So then I knew, and from there, I was buying books. Um, I didn't have a scanner yet, but I would call my brother on the phone and have him look them up on the computer. And then I would, I would write, literally write down the numbers, the ISBN number from the book, and then go call my brother. And then he would look them up, and then I would just go back to the store and, and buy the ones that he said were good from a fucking payphone. Have you ever tried to find a payphone? It's like a fucking dinosaur. Shits are gone. But thankfully to that, to that one old lady, and that's another scenario of me continuing to ask. Like, I, I would just be persistent to the point of being annoying, but just not giving a fuck that I'm being annoying because that's the only way I'm going to get what I want out of this situation. And I didn't know how, how to fucking find the information. So hats off to that old lady. She didn't look exactly like that, but this is pretty close. She was generally joking. Uh, so in the beginning, it was kind of slow, right? I didn't have, I didn't have a lot of money. I, I, I didn't. We were super check to check. Like we, we were like so check to check that it was like, what bill are we gonna pay? Like every bill was always late. Which one are they gonna shut off? That's the one we're gonna fucking pay. And uh, and so it was tough to be able to to buy more books to grow the business because I didn't have any fucking money. Because I need money. I need fucking money. That was my problem. If, if you recognize this, this screenshot, shout out to you. Uh, so remember the grocery money? I was looking at my budget and I was like, where can I get the money that I need to fucking buy more books? Because I could buy more. I knew where they were. I just didn't have the money. Like, it sounds silly. They're only a dollar fifty cents, but I need to buy hundreds a day. And I just didn't have any fucking money to do that. And on Amazon, it sucks. They only pay you every two weeks. So you can make ten thousand dollars in two weeks, but you have to wait two fucking weeks for that money to come out to hit your bank. It comes out every fourteen days. That's it. Um, and, and books are a catalog business where you need to build a large catalog of inventory that sells, similar to other business, maybe real estate, similar to you know, a lot of houses in your portfolio or whatever. So, uh, with the grocery money. I basically looked at that as that's the only part of our budget that can solve my solution, that $500 a month that we were spending on groceries. How the fuck am I going to use that money? We need that money to eat, but I need that money to make more money so we can eat more. What the fuck am I going to do? And growing up as poor as I did, um, we were always getting our food from uh, the food bank or fucking on WIC or, um, you know, I had Thanksgiving at the homeless shelter several times as a kid. And so... I sold my wife on the idea and that we were going to eat at the homeless shelter one night a week and we were going to get all of our food as much as possible from churches, going to churches and waiting in line with everyone else, with fucking homeless people, with whatever, to get our bag of, of groceries, which is like food that's about to expire and shit. But, it, it, you know, you get a bag of rice and beans and thank God my wife is Hispanic and makes amazing rice and beans and fucking it worked, right? So. For a month, we sacrificed, and that $500 is what allowed us to continue because in that month, I bought $500 worth of books, and then the money started coming back, right? And that, that's actually how, how we moved forward. Um, and I didn't understand Amazon at first, right? So I, would, I didn't even know what Amazon was before this. I had never bought anything off Amazon. So I would list my shit on Amazon, and it wouldn't sell. And I'd be like, what the fuck is going on? I listed all this, why is it not selling? <laughs> And what I was doing was there would be 10 pages of offers for a book, and I would go to page 5, and I would price mine in the middle on page 5. I'm like, hey, I'm not too high, I'm not too low, like, there we go, you know? And I finally realized, like, oh, you need to be at or near, this was the beginning of me understanding search engine optimization, basically. You need to be at or near the lowest price so that you can make the sale. Be on the first page of offers, get the buy box, which if you go to Amazon and you click buy, you don't like look at the offers, you just click buy, that's called the buy box. Generally goes to the seller with the lowest price. There's a little bit more factors into that, but it's not coming from Amazon. It can come from sellers, sellers like me as well. And that's what you want on Amazon is to get the buy box. And so once I figured that out, I started making a lot more sales. Uh, but for the longest time, I thought I was like fucking James Bond. Um, I became that guy where you would ask me and I would do, I would do that. Because with reselling, there is zero barrier to entry. And so you have the sense that you want to create a barrier of entry by making it harder for people to compete against you, which is basically standard pre Gary Vee business knowledge, right? Um, so yeah, I didn't tell anybody. And for the first 10 years, and I've been doing this for 13 years, two and a half years ago, 
I was digging in a minute books and I found this book. I scanned it and it wasn't worth money. I just about threw the fucker back, but something told me to look at it. It's called Crush It. Who the fuck titles a book called Crush It? It sounds like a cool guy. It's green and black. That reminds me of money. And on the back, there was a, a quote by Tony Shea, and I had just read uh, Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, which I highly recommend if you haven't read uh, Delivering Happiness. How many people have read that book? Great book, right? It's the fucking, the struggle is fucking gnarly, but everyone should read that book. So because of all those factors, I decided to take this book home and read it. Talking about cashing in on your passion and social media. At the time, I'm still, my mental was more like, oh, I'll make as much money as I can, however the fuck I can, with the least amount of work, and then with all the time left over, I'll do what I actually want to do, which now I know is a really fucked up way to think about stuff, is you'll spend a lot of time doing shit you don't want, right? Um, so I read this book and it changed my life. Then I read the whole book cover to cover the day I got it. I, 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 I used to be that guy that took pictures of his food on social media, and I changed that. Um, and I started using it to broadcast my message. Um, I, had, I just realized that I had video clips I was going to play earlier. Can you play um, the clip number two? Now this seems like a good segue for that. One thing that people don't realize is there's a lot of different ways to flip, meaning you went to books. That homie Resi Resales made a lot of money because he just went all macro. He just bought every book and just made the arm and then decided what to do with the bulk books. Every single person watching this right now can go to Marshalls, buy sneakers, flip them on Amazon and make money. Every single one. Now, some people are happy with $2,000 for 11 hours of work this week. Others aren't. Yeah, okay, so um, we made progress on that, but it's going slower than I'd like. We only made a couple thousand dollars. Only made a couple thousand. Oh my God. Only made a couple thousand? Come on, bro. Anyway, so um, yeah, so that's how I made money. Um, I just made money from several different times he's mentioned me even though he didn't say my name correctly he always said he was a shit student right so it makes sense um <laughs> but that has allowed me to grow my social media a little more like how did they get his attention i'd just be present on his live streams comment answer other people's comments fucking just just trying to connect with the dude and pay him back because it really changed my life in a fucking insane way um let me see what the next slide is so um when I started social media, it was for super selfish reasons. I wanted to be a YouTuber. Growing up, I'd been a skateboarder, um, and that's all I always wanted. I used to make movies when it, I had to use two VCRs to make movies. You know, I made a movie on the first iMac that came out. Um, I like making movies and telling stories, and I always wanted to be a YouTuber, but I never knew how I was going to do it until I read that fucking book. And so, okay, here, I'm going to be a YouTuber. I'm going to use what I know to attract a tribe to form around me and eventually they'll appreciate me so much they'll watch me skateboarding. I don't fucking know, but it seemed like a good recipe, right? Um, but what actually happened is it became a selfless thing. And this is very weird for me because I grew up in a very selfish family. I didn't, you know, we're not religious, you know, it, you know, when I, it's better to give than to receive, I was like, yeah, that's bullshit, give me some shit and I'll tell you how it feels, right? And um, through all of the messages that I get from anybody who has a large social media following, and I know it's been talked about a lot over the course of this weekend, but you get these messages from people and they, they really make you think, right? Like, you changed my life. Oh, hey, Reezy, I'm in Disneyland right now with my kids and I never got to go to Disneyland as a kid, and it's because of you that I'm able to take my family to Disneyland. Like, literally, the video snap, and they're like, at Disneyland, you know, like, thank you, you know? Or, you know, hundreds, if not a thousand people that I've liberated from their nine to five telling me, like, thank you, we can spend more time with the kids now, we can travel more. Whether or not they're, they're still flipping shit or they're doing some aspect of it, they used it as a launching platform to divorce the workforce and to, to become liberated. Because honestly, this whole nine, if you don't love what the fuck you're doing, you need to change that shit. Because this, it's fucking modern day slavery. It's fucking insane. Make you, you don't even know you're in jail, but you're fucking in jail, right? You're not doing what you want to do, right? Like Sean said, what do you want to do? Like I asked, uh, TJ asked my daughter just a second ago, you know, like, what do you want to do? She said, I want to go play with my friends. 
She might be the most enlightened person here, a <laughs> six-year-old. Very quick, very clear and concise. I want to go outside and play with my friends. End of the fucking story, right? Uh, so it gave me uh, a sense of purpose to help people, which I had never had before. And all of a sudden, this selfless thing was making me feel, it's still, I still feel like that's selfish because it makes me feel good when I help people and I like to do it, but I guess that's still selfless or whatever. Seriously addicted to people telling me thank you and that I help them. It's, Gary Vee says it's his oxygen. I say it's probably more like crack or something if I knew what that was like, but. Um, so what happened is I keep getting noticed by Gary Vee and he's just usually just shouting me out or whatever. And then he starts this thing called the 2017 Flip Challenge where he's flipping shit. And his team put me in the video, used clips from my Snapchat from like months ago, which meant they were following me and had recorded it. Um, and then had my Twitter handle on there, which is, I'm really reselled everywhere. So in one day, I gained 2,000 followers on Instagram and YouTube. Like I was just refreshing my shit and like 20, 20, 50, 50. And then the messages started coming in even faster. And I, I was at Disneyland, I remember. Um, and I got a call from my friend because I wasn't really answering my phone. He was like, dude, Gary Vee shouted you out. Like, you're fucking blowing up. And I'm like, what? And it was in that moment that I really realized that how this whole thing was gonna work. Because I always thought it was gonna work. And then I pretty much knew it was gonna work. But then I was just doing it. And it was a really slow hustle grind. <laughs> hustle grinder shit, right? So, uh, I was on my way to becoming a success in the air. But, um, <laughs> then the Gary V shout out, a quick bump up, and then I'm like, fuck, I don't know how, how big is this bump gonna be. Is this, this is how it works, you know, it's a slow grind with an occasional bump, a success that gives you more reach and more audience, and I'm like, and then the messages increase uh, from people telling me thank you, and I, I've had a lifelong severe asthma, like, probably worse than anybody you've ever known. I always had this cough where like I would cough and people would be like, are you fucking okay, dude? And I'm like, oh, I'm fucking fine, you know? Always had an inhaler in my pocket, always took, took medicine and the night before bed, had to have a breathing treatment at my house every single night since I was like 12 years old. And do you, I don't know if you guys know anyone that has a breathing machine for asthma. It's like a shoebox thing, it's super loud. You sit down for like five minutes and it's terrible, but through doing social media, being selfless, helping people, I had a realization and a mind shift that I was like, fuck, I could change the world. Because before I thought that was just bullshit, some shit you tell kids, like, you can change the world, kid. And I was like, from a young age, I was like, yeah, right, that's bullshit, anything's possible. I'm homeless and I live in a hotel. If I'm lucky, like, go fuck yourself, right? <laughs> Anything is not possible. Um, but then I realized it was, and I also realized how one person could have like this vast reach and make a big change on the world. And overnight, my asthma went away. It just fucking vanished, gone. Like, I do not have asthma anymore. And it happened because of the change that happened in my, in my body and my mind when I realized I, I, be, I became purpose-driven. Like, I'm not religious, but I feel like I have this purpose that's greater than me. Like, that could be my legacy, is that I can tell everyone, hey, did you know you could make $100,000 a year selling shit from yard sales part-time on eBay? And a lot of people don't fucking know that. Like that tip alone could just change people's life right there. And so I started my journey and I have a goal that I want to get on the Ellen show someday. So if any of you guys can help me with that, that'd be great. And I want to spread that message to the mass. On Woo! It'll happen, I promise you. Uh, so yeah, social media is doing well. I'm about to hit 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. I need like 100 and something, so you guys can help me out with that. That'd be great. Um, uh, and, I, and I started to be able to travel. I never traveled as a kid, ever. Like, never. Like, Greyhound here and there, and that was it. It wasn't even a qu I've never asked my dad for a dollar my entire life. Like, that's how it was. Um, and in the last year, I uh, spoke in Philadelphia, Rhode Island, New York City, London, California a few times. Um, and so now I'm getting, tra getting able to travel a lot. I just got invited back to go to London. Um, and so this year is mine and my wife's 18 year marriage anniversary. And on our anniversary, we're going to be in Paris at the Eiffel Tower, which is pretty fucking crazy. I learned that I've always talked, but no one listened, right? Shut up, Mike. Shut up. That's my real name, by the way. 
If your name's Mike, you have to have a nickname. That's just how it goes. Uh, my last name is Resendez, so that's why in high school people started calling me Reezy. So that's why I rolled it. Um, but yeah, shut up, shut up, Mike. Shut up. You talk too much, you know. And, and now people are finally listening. And turns out, you know, you can get paid to, to speak. Like, who would have fucking thought, you know? <laughs> a guy that would never shut up and gets paid to talk, you know? Like, amazing. Not that I'm getting paid right now. I'm doing this for Colby. I love Colby. Where are you at, Colby? He's not even in here. Great. Uh, anyway, so from 13 years ago, making 20000 a year, working in a skate shop, um, I now pay myself a $75,000 a year salary. I probably work about 20 hours a week if I'm working hard. And, and last year I also made another 35000 off of my personal brand, off of Reasy Resale. That's strictly like YouTube and affiliate money and just like the random whatever. But that was before I started the email list. And so hopefully I can grow the personal brand stuff to 100000 within the next couple years, which is my goal. Because although I, I like selling shit, it's, it's not what I love, it just provided the ends to the means and it was a hell of a lot better than delivering pizza or digging a hole in the ground or, or whatever else the fuck I would have to do. It's actually kind of fun, kind of like a treasure hunt, right? Um, shipping orders and shit, that's not fun, but finding it is fun. Um, but yeah, it all, started, it all started from Amazon, my whole thing, so thanks, thanks Jeff. He just came out like a fucking action hero and killed it. Uh, so the, if you want to sell shit online, these are pretty much some of the three main places besides like Shopify, which is, is different. You can sell shit on Shopify, but usually that's like a brand you're creating or a product you made or something you're drop shipping or whatever. But if you want to sell stuff, like just stuff, anything new, used, whatever it is, you're going to probably sell it on one of these platforms. eBay is great for, for random stuff, odds and ends. Amazon is great for some used stuff and some odds and ends and really fucking good for new shit. And Poshmark is the spot to sell clothing. Does anyone here sell on Poshmark? Awesome. You guys are like pioneers. That shit is serious. Like, they might overtake eBay for clothing. You know, I think so. Because it's, it's, eBay is fucking dinosaur. They're really slow. They still don't have like video. Like, why is there no video on eBay? It's fucking driving me crazy. Uh, you can sell on Etsy. You can sell on Mercari. You can sell on Depop. Does anybody know about Depop? It's like an Instagram, but it has a built-in checkout. So, but all of these things have different markets, different economics. Like, I know people that sell on like 10 places and they sell everything on whichever one is gonna get them the best return. There's a, there's a website called Cherish, which is made for reselling furniture and antiques. There's so many marketplaces for everything and this shit is always changing. But for the most part, we're gonna focus on these two. Uh, Amazon is where I made most of my money, but I always, I sold on eBay first. eBay was my first love, and then I cheated on her. Sorry, eBay. So it's important to have both of these things in your arsenal, right? Um, and if you do clothing primarily, definitely hit up Poshmark. But eBay is great, right? Sell anything, your money, almost anything. Um, your money returns fast. If I sell an item today, I get to PayPal today. I send it to my bank account. It's in there in one to three days. Or if you have a PayPal uh, Visa card, you can use it right away. So you essentially get the money instantly on on, uh, on eBay. And that's why eBay is great, but Amazon is much better. Because when you list shit on Amazon, it, as long as you're listing shit that's already a product, like that's in demand, you don't have to take a photo of it. It's already there. You can literally scan the barcode and list it on Amazon. And it's all ready to go. No photos, no writing a description, no saying, well, it's like new, but the packaging is nothing. Just it's all built into the system. Don't create listings. They have a massive customer base. Who here has an Amazon Prime account? Basically everybody, like 95%. Uh, and Amazon customers pay more. They pay way more. Like if you were to buy something, like most people don't even go and look on eBay, but if you were looking for something and it was $10 on eBay and it was $15 on Amazon Prime, like where are you gonna buy it? Amazon Prime. Because who knows when the fuck that eBay order is gonna show up. And if it has an issue, who knows what the customer service is gonna be like. Because we know what's gonna happen on Amazon if you if you have a problem. They'll give you your fucking money back. Like right away. Like customers actually get taken better care of than sellers on Amazon. So it's other as a seller on Amazon, 
it's kind of fucking a headache sometimes. Like a full-time job making sure that they pay you the money they owe you. There's so many different ways that they can lose your item, damage it, etc., etc. They're not proactively giving you that money back. You get automated responses. Like it's it's just fucking terrible. The whole thing is automated and algorithms. And I mean, they grew a beast that's way bigger than they could handle. But their focus is customers, which is why their business has grown so large. So it's just something that you have to deal with as an Amazon seller. But this is the key. Like, if DJ Khaled was a seller, he would tell you this is the major key alert. <laughs> fulfillment by Amazon. Who, does everyone know what fulfillment by Amazon is? Most people think you kind of know. Basically what it is is Amazon got so good at storing and shipping stuff that they decided to create a business model around that where they now they store my inventory and ship it to you or you or you when you buy it and they just charge me like super cheap two cents a month per book or something like that and some they get discounted rates with FedEx and UPS so it's like the per unit charges don't even fucking matter because your customers are getting it faster like I won't even buy anything that's prime I like click that box like only show me the prime shit like all the shit, other shit doesn't even really exist to me who knows whose garage that's coming out of mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and, and that's the that's the prime bump, right? You might see, I literally buy stuff on Amazon from non-prime sellers and then send it into Amazon just to make it prime. So I might buy a book or whatever for 10 bucks and then send it back to Amazon and then sell it for 70 bucks because 70 is a low FBA fulfillment by Amazon price. And I know from my own experience, there's a lot of people that aren't even looking at the merchant fulfilled price, which means non-FBA or whatever. So. That's kind of interesting, right? The customers pay so much more, you can make money buying off of Amazon, selling back on Amazon, just in a little different way. Um, but, but the process is really simple. You need to find items that are worth money, right? So, and then ship them to Amazon in bulk for fulfillment by Amazon. So instead of storing your stuff in your garage, on your house, on your shelf, and then it sells, and you go and, oh, I gotta go home, I sold an item, and wrap it up and give it to the postman, that shit works. But with fulfillment by Amazon, I put a thousand items in boxes on a pallet and just ship it off to Amazon in one afternoon. And then they store it and as it sells, they manage it, which is a huge time saver. You know, like if you sell on eBay, when you go on vacation, you have to turn your store off. If you, nothing matters about Amazon. You literally don't have to be anywhere. I could be everywhere buying shit and just sending it to them while I'm on the road and not have to worry about going home and mailing an order or whatever. Yeah, so find it, ship it, manage your inventory, which is important because they're charging you based on different things, so you want to make sure it sells. Wait for the money to come in, and then repeat. Buy more shit, start over again. Uh, what should you sell if you're just getting started as a reseller? So if you're just getting started, I want you to shop your house, which means go through your house and find all the shit that you don't need. Everybody has shit they don't need. Everybody has. 500 to five thousand dollars or more worth of shit in their house that they're not using that they haven't touched for months like Sealed boxes from your last move in your storage like who has a storage locker and doesn't even really know what the fuck is in it anybody? Yeah, there's a lot of shit that you can get rid of so you open them you start looking shit up on eBay or Amazon And you just start selling it. you use the Amazon seller app which is different than the buyer app, has a black logo. You use the Amazon seller app or the eBay app to just start looking shit up and figuring out what's worth money and then just follow the fucking process, whether it's taking photos and writing a description on eBay or I much prefer Amazon, it's way faster. Like I have employees and they do both eBay and Amazon. I always have to crack on them to get them to do the eBay shit because they just would rather just do Amazon shit. That's how, it's just more work, right? It's, it's worth it, it's just more fucking work. Um, the most important thing about selling on Amazon, in my opinion, is this number called sales rank. Amazon assigns a number to every product that is sold on their platform. This number is called the sales rank. So the number one, and it's different by category, the number one in books might be Gary Vee's book if it came out today. Or probably like Harry Potter or whatever the fuck is the flavor of the year. That's the book that sells more copies than any other book in that category. And by sales rank, you can tell how fast an item sells. But the problem is, is the sales rank is not static. It changes all the time. It could be, it's just a moment in time, right? And so the way it works on Amazon is, this is a graph of sales rank over time. And you can see these on this website, keepa.com. 
There's a couple others, but this is my favorite resource for sales rank stuff. And they have a Chrome extension that you can get to pop up on your product pages when you're looking on Amazon and all kinds of shit. Um, but basically what happens is a sales rank goes, it gets pushed down when it sells. So in order to get to number one, it has to fucking sell a lot to push it down to number one. If it doesn't sell, it starts climbing up and getting worse and worse. But then it sells and it spikes. And it gets worse and worse, it sells and it spikes. So you can look at it and go, oh, those spikes represent sales. You don't know how many sales, but you know it represents sales volume, meaning it's sold. And this website and others track it historically. So imagine how much information you can look at a product and make a decision to buy pretty quickly. Like I used to work at the skate shop, ordering shit out of the catalog to put in the store. And it was like, you need me, my new mo. I have no idea what the fuck is gonna sell. I'm like, that looks cool. We'll take 10 of those. That looks, we'll take 20 of those. Like who knows? You're like wrong all the time. But with this, it's, it's hard to be wrong. So the, the orangish area represents Amazon's price. This is actually, I just noticed this is a UK thing, so it's in pounds, it doesn't really matter. Um, is Amazon's price. Amazon's price goes up and down. I actually buy stuff, I have all kinds of alerts set. I buy shit from Amazon to sell back on Amazon against Amazon because they drop their price. They're so cutthroat competitive on certain products that if I drop my price, they'll just match it. it. It might be a $40 price drop, and it might be $40 less for three hours, and then I bought 100 of them, and then the next day, you know, this guy sells out and they're back up to that price that they were before, and I'm, I'm making money off of buying off of directly from Amazon on Amazon and then selling back on Amazon because the price fluctuates. But with this information, you can see what Amazon's price was, you know, because you might not want to buy this item if you have to compete against Amazon because they, you can't get it for cheaper than Amazon. Nobody can. Um, what the sales rank is, what the different various prices were when it sold, so you can look at the spikes and go, okay, well, when that happened, I think it was probably this new one that was selling at this price. So you get a lot of information. Uh, and you even get things like average rank. So like what's the highest rank it's ever been? What's the lowest rank it's ever been? What's the average rank? And you can look at it for one day, for 30 days, for 60 days, for 90 days. But this is the fucking key. Like anybody that asks me, is this a good seller? And I get these fucking messages all the time. And I'm just like, go watch my videos or I'll send them a link to a video I made about sales rank. I'm like, look, learn how to understand sales rank and you don't have to ask me these fucking questions. Like, cause I don't, I don't, I want to teach people how to fish. I don't want to just give them a fish. It makes zero sense because this shit might not last forever. Like, it's hard to think that Amazon won't last forever, right? But um, nothing lasts forever. And if I teach you how it works, it will always work no matter what the fucking platform is, right? It's just, it's just a little bit different. Uh, but when you need to find stuff to sell when you're first getting started or when you're getting into it, you can ask your friends or family. So everybody donates shit to the Goodwill. Tell your friends that you're selling shit, and then they can just bring it to you. And it might be, you know, junk, but I guarantee you there will be some good stuff. You know, you'll find like some nice high heels or something, or or, or whatever. The kids are like, ah, oh, we don't need our Nintendo DSs anymore. We have a Switch, and then you got three Nintendo DSs and twelve games, and those fucking Mario games are twenty-five bucks a piece. You know, even on Nintendo DS. So there's always shit. Um, if you're selling books. The number one source for books besides thrift stores is library book sales. Um, a lot, it's, it's a cool thing, but people donate books to the library. It's the first place people think to donate books is the library. The second place is probably Goodwill or Salvation Army or whatever. But what people don't know is that the library doesn't put the books on the shelf when you donate to the library. They have hundreds, if not thousands, of books that they want to buy, that they're waiting to buy, that they need money for, and they need to pay salaries, and they need new shelves, and new carpet, and whatever. They're not putting them on the shelf, so what do they do? There's an organization for every library has one called Friends of the Library. It's a nonprofit. They run sales that are usual annual, biannual, maybe three or four times a year. And at these sales, they have something called the Member Preview Night. That is the night you have to go. It costs money to get in. You'll get in there, and um, there will most likely be other booksellers in there. And, and it's mayhem, but you're getting books for a quarter each, a dollar each, five bucks for a whole bag full. It's the best prices that you're ever going to get in sources uh, for books. But um, generally, to grow your capital, you and I always tell everyone, where do I go? I got a hundred bucks. How do I start? Well, that's easy. You're going to yard sales and garage sales and thrift stores because you need high ROI, low risk, low cost shit, and that's going to be secondhand stuff. 
The beauty about secondhand is that's not going anywhere. I don't care, Amazon can disappear. Secondhand market's never gonna die. People are always gonna be throwing shit away and undervalued, right? They're like, I don't need this, they, they throw it away. Uh, but always make, make relations, right? Don't just go to the thrift store and, and buy some stuff and leave. Talk to people, smile. Uh, maybe you had a really good day at the thrift store, so you give them $10 Starbucks gift cards. I don't know if any of you guys give out uh, gift cards or whatever to people that your postman or like whatever, but you'd be amazed how far a $10 Starbucks gift card can go in making relations with people, especially people that work shitty nine to five and get treated like shit. And then what happens after that, you know, after you've brought them coffee and donuts or, you know, I buy shoes at the Nike outlet and I'll bring them a pizza. Like, I guarantee I'm the only fucking guy bringing the employees a, a large pepperoni pizza, you know? And when I go in the next time, they're like, come over here, we got shit in the back, we didn't put out yet, we need to show you, right? So, make relations, is very important. Because relations can take you from like, hit or miss sometimes to, let's say it's a thrift store, they, they call you before they put out the new shit. Hey, some guy they donated a whole Nintendo collection, come check it out before we put it on the floor and then they give you a deal. Like, that's gonna make the difference between just swinging, 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 you know, base hit versus hitting base hits every day with an occasional home run. Uh, garage sales, there's an app called Yard Sale Treasure Map app. Anybody heard of it? Great, you guys are on top of the game. If you, if you need to go to garage sales, yard sales, this app is the shit, you just, you bring up the app, you put in your location, or it finds your location, and you see all these balloons. Every balloon is a, is a garage sale, a yard sale. So in a big city, this thing might just look like it has chicken pox, like <laughs> lots of sales, right? So that's not all of them, but it's a good resource. It aggregates Craigslist and other things. Also, uh, Facebook Marketplace is great, local marketplace. Like Facebook Marketplace is severely undervalued. I believe they will um, take over Craigslist eventually, because Craigslist is kind of creepy sometimes. Um, but Facebook is cool, you know, I can, Tyler, sorry, I keep, he's right in front of me, so, Tyler's selling something on Facebook Marketplace, and I can click on his profile and see it, and there he is, with his wife and his kids, and I'm like, well, they like him, so like, he can't be that much of a creeper, right? And, and then you make the transaction, and it's like, there's so much, you know, offer up, let go. You can literally do a whole resale business just buying shit off of offer up. I know a guy that follows me works at 9 to 5, his name is Steve. He, he only pretty much buys off of Facebook Marketplace and offer up and he sets the deals up while he's at work and he buys from the location that's between his home and his work. So on the way to work and on the way back, he's picking up stuff from people, a new HP printer, a new toner cartridge, like shit that's sealed. And like, how much for this toner? I got 12 of them. Oh, eight bucks each. They sell for fucking 75 bucks on Amazon. He just grabs 12 of them for like eight bucks each. It's pretty much a no brainer. Next door. Uh, next door is another app. Yeah, Next Door is a great one too. It's uh, anybody know about Next Door? Yeah. It's it's coming up a little bit, but it's like a bulletin board for your neighborhood. Would you say? now. Right, and they have more selling built in now. All right, I'm slipping. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is that the information that I've already given you is enough for you to figure out and make it work. But the key, another key, is is get better tools to get better at your job, to become, become more efficient. And that is having that fucking laser beam thing that I didn't know what it was. So it's, it's a Bluetooth barcode scanner. It costs anywhere from $50 for a really chintzy one uh, that might break in a year to $100 or $150 for a nice refurbished one that's probably 300 brand new. Um, and they're small, they're smaller than this clicker, about half as thick or about half as long. And I Velcro it to the back of my phone case, and then I have an app on my phone that has, it makes it efficient to search Amazon. You can do it with the Amazon seller app, but this app, you'll scan stuff, all the prices come up, all the offers, sales rank, reviews, one click to see the graph, one click to search for that same item on eBay, and it makes your job much faster. With books um, and media, CDs, DVDs, books, a lot of it is junk. 95% of everything you scan is gonna be junk. And so I always tell people, your job is not to find the good shit to sell, your job is to get through the bad shit as fast as possible. And thank God somebody invented uh, a database in an app. So once a day, you can download the entire database of Amazon into your phone, and then you can scan shit like in the back of the store where there's no reception. And more importantly, instead of scanning something and waiting one to five seconds for the signal to come back and getting your results, 
you get it in about a quarter of a second. You can literally scan a barcode, and when you notice your laser disappeared because you scanned a barcode, you'll look at your screen, and the results are already there. That's how fast it is. So I could go through a shelf, and I could scan a book a second. So a lot of people would walk into a store and be like, well, there's 5,000 books. This is going to take forever. No, it's not. You literally doof, 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 doof. One hand is pull the book out. The other one scans the barcode. You're wearing headphones that alert you when you find a good one. It goes off. You look at the screen. You're like, yep, that's a good one. You put it in your bag. Just rinse and repeat, right? Uh, but that's it's very important because if you don't understand that, you might give up because you, you have to, to get better to scale. Uh, you know, I have employees that work for me. They go to stores on routes that I've developed and had made relations with, and they, they buy books. Or I also buy shoes, and I have some workers that, that buy shoes for me too, but I'm not packaging shit up and sending it to Amazon anymore. I hate that. That's my least like problem of it. I mean, and my time is worth more now, so if I'm buying, I'm only buying shoes because I make about $20 profit per pair. I'll go to the Nike store, spend like 5000 fill my car up. But, um, and then I take it all home and I just dump it on my workers and they process it, enter it into Amazon, and then send the shipments off. But it's super important to scale. People always ask me, like, when do I, when should I hire? And I'm like, well, if, you know, if you can't just like afford it right away, you need to hire when you know you could be making more money. So if you're doing something in your business and you're thinking right now like, fuck, I'm doing this thing and because of this, I can't do that part of it. And that part is the part that makes me money because in sales, reselling business, buying, you make your money when you buy, right? As long as you're making good buying decisions, right? So you hire someone to do the processing so that you can focus on buying. And I've also have people that, that buy for me, teams of buyers. So. Uh, and what I was talking, what I do mostly with the used books, that's considered retail arbitrage, but it's a little different because it's secondhand stuff, um, used books, garage sales, all that kind of stuff. But that's retail arbitrage, um, buying stuff from stores and selling online. Go to Kmart, go to Walmart. Right now, uh, Nickelodeon, just I don't know if any of you know this, but Nickelodeon released uh, slime ketchup. It's ketchup, but it looks like Nickelodeon slime. It's ketchup made by Nickelodeon. I would never eat it. But um, when they dropped, nostalgia sells. I don't know if anybody knows that. And so the internet did what the internet does. And people started writing articles about the slime. YouTubers started making videos of them sliming themselves with the Nickelodeon ketchup. And in a day or two, Walmart.com was completely sold out of the Nickelodeon slime ketchup. But you can still get it at local Walmarts. And then on Amazon, the price is way jacked up. Um, on the way here, I was stopping at, I usually don't work. I, I should sell when I'm traveling because I like to enjoy it because I never got to do it as a kid. On the way here, um, I'm in Starbucks and there's an Asian dude. Asian dudes are always on top of shit, I'm telling you. Um, and I, I swear, I'm not, I'm not even fronting, man. They're always at the forefront of everything somehow. Um, I'm in line, dude has 10 Starbucks cups in a stack, not filled with a drink. And I'm, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you like that cup, huh? Like, what are you doing? And he's like, my wife really likes this cup. I'm buying it for her. I'm like, yeah, right, dude. Like, <laughs> so I went to the car and I kind of looked it up. Um, first, I asked him, what's the price on those cups? They're $3. Just came out this weekend. It's a frosted venti Starbucks cup. It looks like a Tupperware consistency. It's not hard plastic. It's soft plastic. It's frosted. It comes with a lid, a reusable straw. They're 3 bucks in Starbucks. Dude just bought 10 and I found right away on eBay pretty good comps, completed sales um, for $20 with free shipping for two of them together. So he's probably making, he's doubling his money for sure on that, it, at least if not maybe tripling it a little bit. But there's opportunities like that all the fucking time, all the time. And that's what retail arbitrage is, is buying in retail stores and then selling online. Uh, there's online arbitrage, same shit, except for I'm buying from online stores. And that, the beauty of that is there's software programs that will scrape entire websites. I can run a program that will scan the entire Walmart and I'll say, only show me the results for shit that I can make at least two bucks on, that has a sales rank of X, that Amazon's not, so blah, 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 and then when I wake up, it's done, and there's a list, and then I just go and see if it's in stock and I just buy it. And that's thousands of websites, more websites than you could ever think of using. That software um, is called Tactical Arbitrage, which is, it's amazing, I think it's like 100 bucks a month. Um, but there's people that are using, that's their entire business model, they use 
tactical arbitrage to buy shit, online arbitrage. They don't even have a sense of themselves. They send it to third-party fulfillment or prep centers. They receive it, check it, and ship it off to Amazon. So imagine that, that's your entire job. Two or three hours a day, you buy shit online. Some people do it on their phone even, and get sent to your, your prep center, which charges you 50 cents or a dollar an item to package it all up for you, and you never have to fucking touch it. Which is, another thing is some of these prep centers are in tax-free states, so depending on how much you're buying, the prep center is like, it doesn't even matter, you're saving money even after paying them because you're able to ship it to a tax-free state and not get charged sales tax. Uh, then there's wholesale. Wholesale is the same thing, except for instead of going out and finding stuff from random places, you're making relations with companies and buying their products and then selling them on Amazon, uh, which is great because that shit already has demand and, and it just goes. Imagine, you know, you're selling Beats headphones and you get a thousand pairs of them and maybe you're only making eight bucks on each one, you sell a thousand pairs in a week. Pretty cool. And then imagine you have a thousand or five thousand products just like that, you know? Uh, the problem with wholesale is that a lot of people don't want to make wholesale accounts with Amazon sellers, so you have to be a little tricky about it. You could be upfront, um, or you could be a little tricky. You could make your own e make your own e-commerce website, um, and when they ask you, you know, do you sell online, and you're like, oh, we sell everywhere. You know, we sell here, we sell there. You know, but you need a website because if you're emailing a wholesaler for an account and it's, you know. Reezy resells at gmail.com, they might not even answer it. It needs to be the email contact to the wholesaler needs to be from your domain, and your domain needs to look like a real business, maybe even have an actual functioning checkout, and that will increase your ability to get wholesale accounts with people. Um, some people will give you an account if you tell them, but um, I wouldn't recommend saying that unless that question comes up. I wouldn't recommend lying, but just you need to get these fucking accounts. If you have wholesale accounts, you can't sell wholesale. Um, but, but the greatness of that is not, you know, going out to find stuff, it just comes to you. Uh, private label. Private label is really awesome too. It's, it's similar to wholesale, except for instead of selling stuff that already exists, you're making your own products. This could be as simple as ordering stuff from Alibaba.com or DHgate and, and slapping a label on it or changing the color or having your logo stamped into it or improving on the packaging or you see an item that's selling pretty well but their images suck, their listing sucks. So you buy the same thing but you change it a little bit so it's yours and then you make a new listing for your version of that item and you make great photos, great listing and you can siphon some of their, their search and, and make sales or whatever. But it also goes as far as um, making a brand. Um, that company, I think it's uh, Aukey, you guys know this company, A-U-K-E-Y? They make like battery chargers and little electronic stuff. They started out as an Amazon, on Amazon as a private label, but they made it into a brand. And if you build a brand, so instead of just selling a spatula and a, a shoe slipper on her and a colander or whatever the hell, a garlic press, um, you make a brand and you create products that fit in your brand around the brand theming and maybe you have several different brands But when you have a brand you create an asset and I know people that have sold their brand Which was built on Amazon for a million dollars and then made another million dollar brand afterwards Like I know a 24 year old that did that pretty fucking cool uh, And then there's drop shipping drop shipping um, You need to check out what the rules are on eBay and Amazon. They're always changing you used to not be able to do it on Amazon at all. Um, the rules are different now, but basically you're selling something before you have it, and then when they buy it, then you go and get it, and then ship it to the customer. And it could be you're selling on eBay or Amazon, and it's a Walmart product. It could be you have a wholesaler that ships directly to your customers for you. But that's the scenario for what drop shipping is. And then there's uh, print on demand, which Colby was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, and he actually, it's funny, he actually, mentioned those Hollyweed shirts, right Colby? Yep, Hollyweed. Anyways, um, so, but I actually know friends, Colby, that sold the Hollyweed shirts also. Like, I don't even really remember what happened, but it was like in social media, and people re realized it, and they made shirts and sold them. The great thing about print on demand, so you can sell print on demand on Amazon. It's called Merch by Amazon. I believe it's merch.amazon.com. It's free to sign up. Everybody should sign up right now. Um, and you upload designs and they sell. That's the whole, the whole business. You upload a design, like right now I'm selling a bunch of 4th of July shirts. It's literally the dumbest shit. A donut wearing an Uncle Sam hat that says, you know, 
uh, George Washington with a, a Uncle Sam hat that says George Sloshington. Like, the dumbest shit. But people are buying shirts off of Amazon, so I sell a shirt on Amazon for 20 bucks. I make $5 revenue. I pay my, I have a designer in Venezuela. I pay her $4.50 a month to design 300 unique designs for me. I give her the ideas. And then I have another, another girl that uploads those designs to Amazon for me for 10 cents a design. That costs me about 200 bucks a month. So, um, I also sell print-on-demand t-shirts on Etsy using a service called Printful, which is, I think it's even better than Amazon's solution. Printful's free, Etsy's almost free, they link together, you upload designs to Printful, it gets published to your Etsy store, when it sells, you make money. And the brilliant part of this is that Etsy and Amazon, unlike Shopify, no offense to Shopify sellers, I, I don't know how to do that really, um, they have lots of organic traffic. So you're not driving traffic, you're literally just putting shit up that people already want and then they're buying it, right? Um, I, like I just sold a bunch, uh, it's, is it Pride Month still? Yeah, so a bunch of Pride shirts, rainbow shirts, LGBTQ, all that kind of stuff. Um, but print on demand is great because it's actually more profitable than used books, I think, which kind of amazed me because there's nothing, you know, buy a book for a quarter, sell it for a hundred bucks, like what's more profitable than that? But you're getting a design for like a dollar, a quarter, three bucks when you scale it out from your designer. And it's continuing to sell and continuing to sell over time. And you just build up this catalog and you don't have any inventory. On Merch by Amazon, Amazon, you're not even selling it, Amazon's selling it and they're licensing your designs. So you also have no customer service. So you have no inventory, no customer service. All you literally need is a laptop and an idea and you can upload designs from fucking anywhere, which is insane. Um, Etsy, there's a little bit of customer service if customers aren't happy, but it's pretty simple. And I highly recommend print on demand as a way, as an e-commerce solution for a lot of people. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be a designer. You could use an app on your phone called Typorama or Word Swag to make your own text arrangements. It's literally automatic. You just press it and it generates new versions of the text and the style you choose. And then use another app called Over, build shirts on your fucking phone. Like I'm literally in line at Disneyland making shirts on my phone. And then, and then uploading them and making sales like a day later. Like you could, print on demand is super unique because something can happen. Donald Trump can say some shit. I'm not getting political, I'm just talking about opportunity here. He could say something, and then if you follow him on Twitter, you know that's a shit fest. Anytime he says anything, thousands of comments. The attention is there. So he can say something, and then I can see it's blowing up, and then I can go make a shirt on it, and then I can jump into the comments on Twitter five minutes after he said this, and I can say, yeah, that's cool, how about this? Boom, and I'll make a few sales on that shirt. How insane, and in what business do you know that you can recognize a market opportunity, create a product in five minutes, and be making sales five minutes after that? Fucking nothing. Nothing but print on demand. Um, but educate yourself, guys. You can find my YouTube channel by going to reezy.tv. Uh, go to YouTube, there's tons of YouTubers that make helpful comment, uh, content. Facebook groups is the hidden gem of Facebook. Like, there's people that don't use Facebook groups, and I like, could give a fuck about Facebook except for the groups. It's the best part about Facebook. So get in some groups and learn from people for free. Um, and then also Instagram. On Instagram, a lot of resellers are on Instagram. I can't, I don't know the why of it, but it's like worth 40, but as a point. Uh, but basically, e-commerce changed my life. And I know it can change your guy's life as well, whether or not any of those directions that you take it. And that's why I say that if you ain't flipping, you slipping. Yeah! yeah. Thank you guys.